Hello and welcome to the Solo Meal Medicine channel. Today's lecture topic is a brief history of vaccination. I encourage you to teach your friends, your family, what you will learn in this presentation because through the teaching process, you will retain more of the information. Without further ado, let's jump straight into it. And I would like to begin this presentation with a couple of quotes that I feel are highly relevant to the topic at hand. The first quote is from Francis Darwin, who was one of the sons of Charles Darwin, who discovered the theory of evolution by natural selection. In science, the credit goes to the man who convinces the world, not the man to whom the idea first occurs. So this is the first quote. The second quote is from Sir Isaac Newton, one of the greatest, if not the greatest scientist of all time. If I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And what Newton meant by this was that his ideas were not his own. He relied on the ideas and concepts uh, of his predecessors, those who came before him. And by relying on their ideas, he was able to, metaphorically speaking, stand on the shoulders of giants and see further. So these are two quotes I would like for you to keep in mind, please. As I said, they're highly relevant to the uh, history of vaccination. So let's begin with a game of who wants to be a millionaire. And we are going to start off with the million dollar question first. And there's only one question actually, so the million dollar question. And the question is, which number is the largest? So which number is the largest? Is it A, the number of species currently on Earth? B, the number of stars in the Mil Milky Way galaxy? C, the number of water molecules in a drop of water? Or D, the number of bacteria on Earth? So I'll give you, you know, 5 to 10 seconds to lock your answer in. And I'll put the questions up on the screen once again. A, B, C, or D. And if you selected option D, you are correct. The number of bacteria on Earth is the largest number. So why is this the case? Well, with regard to option A, the number of species on Earth, it's estimated that there are around 9 million different species on Earth. Option B, the number of stars in our galaxy, which is the Milky Way galaxy, it's estimated at 400 billion stars. Option C, the number of water molecules in a drop of water is estimated at around 1,500 billion billion molecules of water. And the correct answer, option D, number of bacteria on Earth is an estimated 5 million trillion trillion bacteria on Earth. And here now is just a quick side-by-side -side comparison of all the figures just to uh, demonstrate the immensity of the number of bacteria on Earth. Okay, so where am I going with all this? Well, we live in the world of the bacteria because bacteria live in us, on us, around us, and everywhere. In fact, bacteria make up 78% of all the species on Earth. Another way to look at this is by looking at the tree of life. So the tree of life can be divided into three categories or three domains. There's the bacteria domain, the archaea domain, and the eukaryota domain. All the species in the bacteria domain are microbial, meaning they are only able to be viewed under the microscope. The same is true for the archaea domain. Archaea are very similar to bacteria in many ways. There are some differences which we won't talk about in this presentation, uh, but the take home message here is that archaea are also microbial. Eukaryota, majority of the species in eukarya eukaryota are also mi microbial. Um, and everything, all the animals that we can see, so elephants, giraffes, cat, dog, human beings, we fall under this kingdom here, the animals, animal kingdom. Uh, so take home message here, majority of life on Earth is microbial. With that said, let's define a few terms. So we've spoken about microbes, microbial. Well, a microbe is the same thing as a microorganism, an organism that is only able to be viewed underneath a microscope. More specifically now, microbes that cause disease, we can call them germs. Another term for germs is pathogens. 
So pathogens are disease-causing organisms that cause disease in humans. And there are different types of pathogens. There are bacteria that can cause disease. There are viruses, fungi, single-celled eukaryotic organisms called protozoa, and there are other types of pathogens as well. So let's go back to a point in time where we didn't know about microbes, we didn't know about pathogens, and we didn't have any vaccines. I've picked the Roman Empire. So Rome wasn't built in a day, but it fell in one. So why did the Roman Empire fall in 476 AD? We, we, well, we will look at one potential reason. Let's firstly look at at Roman demographics. People of the Roman Empire, around 50% of children died before the age of five. The average life expectancy was around 25 years. Compare this to today's global average, which is around 79 years. And if we look at the height of people of the Roman Empire, they were, they were shorter than people of pre and post Roman societies. So they were shorter. So on the topic of height, let's look at height in greater detail. So height is determined by two things, your genetics and also the environment in which you live. And by environment in which you live, I mean what sort of diseases you could potentially catch and the nutrition that, was, uh, that is available to you in the environment in which you live. In fact, height is a measure of biological standards of living. And we will look at a couple of examples to demonstrate this. So over the past century, heights have increased, but they are beginning to plateau in wealthy nations, meaning that uh, there is a limit to human height. Height won't continue to increase forever, uh, because as I said, it's starting to plateau. And the increase in height is due to better nutrition and better health, particularly better health and nutrition during childhood, because during childhood is when our growth rate is at its greatest, and uh, therefore when the effects of uh, nutrition and health are most, in, most uh, paramount. So let's look at an actual example now. Uh, Finland versus Afghanistan. Childhood mortality. So 0.2% of children die before the age of five in Finland versus 7.4% in Afghanistan. And if we look at the average male height, 180 centimeters in Finland versus 165 in Afghanistan. So we can see here that the measure of height can be used as a measure of the biological standards of living. So back again to the Roman demographics, the figures here are not that great. So we can imply that the biological standards of living in the Roman Empire were not high. There were epidemics, pestilence, disease was rife. There was smallpox, which is caused by a viral infection, and we'll talk more about smallpox in this presentation. There was plague, a bacterial infection, malaria, a protozoal infection, and other bacterial infections, cholera, typhoid, syphilis, amongst other diseases as well. So here is an artist's representation of plague affecting Rome. The title is The Angel of Death Striking a Door During the Plague of Rome. So it was due to disease. This is one reason why the Western Roman Empire fell in 476 AD, because diseases left the Roman people defenseless and demoralized when it came to the barbarian attack. So here we have an image of uh, the sacking of Rome and uh, another image here of the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire, Romulus Augustus, handing over his crown before one of the barbarian leaders. So how did we discover where germs and disease come from? Well, I would like to go back to 1957, April Fool's Day in Switzerland. And there was an April Fool's Day prank that aired on the BBC. It was a three minute uh, clip that showed a spaghetti harvest. So it showed spaghetti growing from trees and people harvesting this spaghetti. And um, 
in the clip, they were talking about the growing conditions and, and talking about the spaghetti harvest. And the thing is, a lot of people fell for this April Fool's Day prank. Many people did in fact believe that spaghetti grew from trees. So I would like to ask you if, I mean, spaghetti, noodles, pasta have been around for thousands of years. And in 1957, many people were fooled. So if people can be fooled about the origins of spaghetti, what about the origins of disease, the origins of germs and microbes, things that cannot even be seen without the aid of a microscope? So this is just something to consider as we look at where disease and germs come from. Another thing I would like for you to consider, please, is to come up with a scene in your mind of a family barbecue or a get-together with your friends having a barbecue. It could look like this, for example, the scene from Fast and the Furious, enjoying a barbecue, sitting down, enjoying some alcohol, some wine, some beer, um, etc. Uh, you may have, for example, your pet dog nearby. He's Jack and Shiraz. Um, I'll share with you my uh, the scene that comes to my mind. So here's my family barbecue scene. Uh, it's a nice sunny day outdoors, sitting out with nature, maybe some nice trees nearby barbecue cooking some meat, uh, pet dog, family all together enjoying the moment, maybe enjoying some wine, some meat, and some ice cream or dairy, milk-based desserts. So come up with a scene in your mind, and at the end of this presentation, we will relate this scene to a history of vaccination. So once again, yes, please keep these things in mind. Okay, let's now look at some plagues. Aristotle believed that uh, plagues of mice and plagues of frogs, for example, came from non-living things. More specifically, that frogs could come from damp earth and that mice could come from decaying grain. This sort of thinking is the theory of spontaneous generation. The theory that living things come from non-living things. A prime example of spontaneous generation was maggots appearing from rotting meat. And this sort of thinking persisted for hundreds and hundreds of years. For example, I mean, so Aristotle's time, right? Aristotle was born uh, 384 BC. Uh, there were scientists in the 1600s that still believed in the theory of spontaneous generation. So here we have... Jean-Baptiste van Helmont, he was a chemist and he came up with a recipe on how to create mice. So you take a dirty shirt, stuff it into the neck of a vessel containing wheat and in 21 days you'll observe the transformation of grains into mice. So scientists were coming up with recipes uh, based on this theory of spontaneous generation. And this sort of thinking, as I said, persisted. For, for hundreds of years. This was until the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came along to save the day. And what I mean by that is the Renaissance period. Rena Renaissance is French for rebirth. And it was a period in our history of scientific, political, economic and artistic enlightenment. Where we discovered the forces that shape the human body and shape our universe. And what I, be what I mean uh, further now by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming along is that uh, considering that the Renaissance was a period of art artistic enlightenment, there were four great Renaissance artists. We had Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo. And this is who the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were named after, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, so let's look at some actual Renaissance figures just to set the scene of, you know, the type of thinkers that came from this period. We had Nicholas Copernicus, who... Uh, came up with the heliocentric model of the universe, the theory that the sun and not the earth was is at the center of our solar system. We also have William Shakespeare, only the greatest writer and playwright of the English language, and Galileo Galilei. He discovered many things. One of them were, was the uh, moons of Jupiter, for example, amongst other uh, key theories in physics. So let's now look at a few other Renaissance figures and their contributions to our understanding of where germs and disease come from. 
First in line, we have an Italian physician, poet, and scholar by the name of Girolamo Fracostoro. And he came up with this theory in 1546 that there are these things called contagions and that these contagions are involved in the disease process. So contagions were these tiny particles that could spread through the air or via contact and spread disease. And the term contagion comes from the Latin contagio, which means to touch. In fact, it's the same stem as the word contagious. We know that contagious diseases are diseases that we can catch uh, from, uh, from, from another person, from an infected person, and that such diseases are spread via close contact or through the air, for example. The period now between 1590 and 1610 was when the first microscope was developed. And it was developed by a Dutch spectacle maker by the name of Zachariah Janssen. So he, along with his father Hans Janssen, developed this compound microscope. So it was a microscope with a couple of lenses. And here we have an image of uh, a replica, uh, an image of the replica of the first microscope. It wasn't the most powerful microscope. It could magnify things to about three to 10 times. Uh, just as a comparison, to look at some microscopic algae or microscopic protozoa, you need about two to 400 times. And to look at some bacteria, you need at least around a thousand times. So uh, definitely wasn't the most powerful microscope, but it was a microscope nonetheless. And several figures utilize microscopes to examine you know, the human body and the world around us. One of them was an English scientist by the name of Robert Hooke, and he used uh, microscopes to examine cork. So cork, for example, the same type of cork that you have in wine bottles, for example, is made from the bark of certain types of trees. And being a tree, trees are made up of plant cells, and therefore cork is made up of plant cells. So Hooke, when he examined cork underneath the microscope, Notice that it was made up of these things that he called cells. And, and Hooke also suggested that living things were made up of, of cells. And this was in 1665. And here are some figures published by um, Hooke uh, demonstrating his observation of uh, cork cells. The year now is 1683. And there was a Dutch scientist, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. He developed a more powerful microscope. Uh, it's believed that he developed a solar microscope that utilized uh, light from the sun to come up with a better image when viewing objects underneath the microscope. And van Leeuwenhoek, he examined conditions such as the inside of the mouth and seawater. And he noticed that there were these things that he called animacules that he was able to view underneath the microscope. And these animacules were actually bacteria. Uh, so he was actually looking at bacteria. Um, but he called them animacules or little animals. And here are some drawings from Van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, here we have, and, and he used terms uh, such as round, spiral, and rod shaped to describe these animacules. And uh, what Van Leeuwenhoek proposed was that, and what he firmly believed also, was that these animacules did not generate through spontaneous generation, but rather came from existing animacules, right? So he did not believe that these animacules came from spontaneous generation. I wanted to include a few diagrams now of, you know, bacteria, some key classes of bacteria. So we have, for example, uh, an image of Staphylococcus aureus here. It's a round shaped bacteria. Uh, the name Staphylococcus is uh, from Greek and Latin origin. Staphylo meaning a bunch of grapes and coccus meaning round because this bacteria resembles a bunch of grapes. So these round bacteria is what Van Leeuwenhoek described as well, round shaped bacteria. There's also Treponema pallidum, which is the bacteria that causes syphilis. And um, again, you know, Van Leeuwenhoek uh, described some spiral shaped bacteria. We also have rod shaped Escherichia coli or E. coli. Again, you know, testament to uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's uh, description of the animalcules that he had examined underneath the microscope. 
So he had, you know, described forms of bacteria that uh, we still use today. So despite, you know, animalcules, contagions, and living organisms coming from cells, it was around 200 years before these ideas began to gain acceptance. And that was until there were some key experiments disproving the theory of spontaneous generation. So there were several experiments, but I will outline to you now four experiments that contributed to uh, the disproving of the theory of spontaneous generation. And we'll start off with Francesco Redi. So Francesco Redi uh, was an Italian doctor, scientist, and a poet, and he's considered the father of experimental biology. Recall that maggots appearing in meat was a prime example of spontaneous generation, right? So Redi conducted an experiment involving meat and maggots. So this was in 1688. So he place some meat inside a glass jar and this glass jar was not sealed so the piece of meat attracted flies and the flies laid eggs and the eggs developed into maggots so meat in this uncovered glass um, attracted flies flies laid eggs which grew into maggots he also had a piece of meat in another glass jar but this time it was covered with a muslin cloth type of fabric and it also attracted flies but these flies laid eggs on top of the muslin cloth and no maggots developed in the piece of meat but what Francesco Redi then did and this is not shown in this slide he collected some of the eggs placed them on top of another piece of meat and lo and behold those eggs turned into maggots growing on the piece of meat. So here, Francesco already demonstrated that the theory of spontane spontaneous generation was not true when it came to maggots emerging from meat. But scientists and chemists at the time were saying that, okay, so you've explained that, you know, things that we can see, such as insects, flies, come from pre-existing insects and flies. But what about uh, when meat broth and vegetable broth goes off or spoils. So this experiment didn't really explain that. That was until Lazzaro Spallanzani conducted an experiment that built upon the results of Redi's experiment. So this is the ex second experiment now that we'll talk about, the second of four, meat broth. So Spallanzani was an Italian scientist and priest, and he was, as, a, as I said, familiar with Redi's uh, work. So the experiment that Spallanzani conducted went something like this. He had a couple of beakers. In one of the beakers, he had some meat broth, and he had heated this meat broth with, with a flame and boiled the meat broth to kill any germs that may have been in the meat broth. So he did this for a couple of beakers. So meat broth in two beakers, he heated, he, he boiled the meat broth in both of them. What he then did was cover, or seal rather, one of the beakers with a special seal, an airtight seal, that uh, also removed uh, any air from the glass jar as well. He left the other glass jar unsealed and exposed to the air. And by the way, this experiment was conducted in 1765. So after covering both of the beakers, he waited for a while and he observed. And what he observed was that the beaker that contained the meat broth that was previously boiled, but then sealed with his special airtight seal, showed no signs of spoilage. It didn't go off. It was still uh, a clear meat broth. And uh, yeah, once again, showed no signs of spoilage. Compare this with the other, the other jar, which also contained meat broth, uh, but it was exposed to the air, and this meat broth went off. It spoiled. So here we have some experimental evidence showing that you know things like meat broth, if we first heat them to kill the microbes, if we then expose it to the air, which can which contains microbes these microbes can then cause meat broth to spoil so meat broth does not spoil due to spontaneous generation but because Palanzani 
uh, sealed uh, the meat broth here that did not go off. And at the time, it was known that oxygen was required by animals for animals to survive. So it was proposed that by sealing and removing the oxygen from this glass jar, this was the reason why spontaneous generation did not occur because there was no oxygen or air inside the glass jar. So that's why the meat broth did not spoil. And this is why this meat broth did spoil because it was exposed to air and spontaneous generation could occur. Which brings us now to the third experiment of four. Vegetable broth and glass tubes. So there was a German chemist, his name was Franz Schultz. And in 1836, he conducted an experiment showing that uh, a lack of oxygen was not the reason why broth does not spoil. And let's quickly talk through Schultz's experiment. So he had a glass flask and in this flask was some vegetable broth and this vegetable broth was boiled, you know, similar to Spallanzani's experiment. The flask was sealed and in and through the lid of the seal were two bent glass tubes. Schultz blew into blew air into one of the glass tubes and the air passed through some sulfuric acid. Air that passed through sulfuric acid was uh, any microbes that happened to be in the air were, were killed off by the sulfuric acid because the sulfuric acid kills the microbes. So he blew air into this, uh, sulfuric acid were in these chambers here, air passed through sulfuric acid, landed up in the flask containing the vegetable broth. He then drew air out from this glass tube. So this glass, glass tube contained these chambers containing potassium hydroxide, and once again, potassium hydroxide kills any microbes as well. So air coming in, air coming out, so this vegetable broth that was previously boiled came into contact with air, but any of the air was uh, sterilized by this sulfuric acid and uh, any air going out had this potassium hydroxide barrier here. So air that went in and went out had to um, pass through these chemicals, which killed off the microbes. And what he demonstrated was that this vegetable broth did not go off and that was despite it coming into contact with air. This was in 1836. And there were other scientists that did very similar experiments to Schultz and came up with the same conclusions, that spontaneous generation simply was not true. One of the scientists was John Tyndall, one of them was Theodore Schwann, and we'll talk more about them later. The fourth experiment now involves silkworms. So here we have a silkworm and the silkworm, when it becomes a silk moth, it, uh, it grows inside this silk cocoon that it produces. And from this silk cocoon, you can uh, obtain silk threads and manufacture silk garments. So the fourth, fourth experiment, silkworms and fungus, goes something like this. The silk industry was threatened. And this was due to a disease that was impacting silkworms. So silkworms were covered in this in a in a hard white substance, and it was believed that this substance was from spontaneous generation that it spontaneously generated. So there was an Italian entomologist. Entomology is a study of insects, uh, and uh, this scientist was Agostino Bassi, and he conducted an experiment involving silkworms that again disproved this idea of spontaneous generation. So here we have happy, healthy, normal silkworms. On the right here, we have a diseased silkworm covered in this hard white substance. So Bassi, in 1835, conducted an experiment. And what he did was he obtained some sick silkworms uh, covered in this hard white substance. He scraped some of this substance off and placed it on top of a normal, healthy silkworm. What happened to this normal silkworm is that it became diseased with the very same disease that the original silkworm had. So he showed that you could transfer disease um, and that the, the disease did not arise from spontaneous generation. So what 
Bassi had identified was actually a fungus. It was a fungal infection, and the name of the fungus is Bovaria bassiana, named in honor of Bassi. And Bassi also came up with, also believed that human diseases, you know, such as cholera and plague, you know, diseases that affected the Romans, for example, could also spread um, in, in the same way. So caused by these living parasites that could be spread from one uh, organism to the other. So here we have, you know, five scientists who contributed to disproving the theory of spontaneous generation. But would the world need even more evidence? We shall find out shortly. But before we do, let's look at smallpox. So we mentioned when we were talking about the Romans that we will talk about smallpox, and the time has come. Okay. Smallpox is a viral infection caused by, caused by a virus, and the name of the virus is the variola virus. Variola is the Latin term for pock or pustule, and we'll talk about more and we'll talk more about this in a moment. So it's believed that this virus first emerged around 10,000 BC, roughly the same time that human beings began forming agricultural societies. And for thousands of years, smallpox, which is a devastating disease, has affected mankind, right? For thousands of years. So smallpox is a highly contagious, as I said, viral infection and spread by close contact can also be spread through the air. So once the virus enters the airways, the respiratory tract, it then travels to the lymph nodes. So these are the uh, nodes that we have in our neck, uh, around our collarbone, under our arms, in our groin. We have uh, lymph nodes elsewhere in our body as well, but these are the areas where we can easily feel them. Uh, and once the virus you know, it gets to the lymph nodes, it begins to multiply, and then it spreads throughout the body. So the symptoms associated with the smallpox infection include feeling unwell, fever, vomiting, headache. There are other symptoms as well, but let's focus on this characteristic rash that smallpox produces. Now, people affected with smallpox, uh, images of people affected with smallpox, um, can be a little bit confronting, but I feel it's important to include them in a presentation such as this one, where we are talking about, uh, you know, a brief history of vaccination because, you know, it's, it's, it's part of our human history. So here we have an image of a young child affected with smallpox, and we can see this characteristic rash. So smallpox really is the stuff of nightmares. Um, so the rash is most prominent on the face, but it can occur anywhere on the body. It can also occur internally, for example, inside the mouth and in the, in the throat and, and uh, digestive tract. And smallpox is a highly fatal viral infection, has a 30% fatality rate. And those fortunate enough to survive can experience complications such as blindness. It can cause infertility and also cause scarring. So initially, these pox or pustules, so the rash, individual pox, which, which is made up of individual pox or pustules. Uh, initially, they contain a liquid, and uh, throughout the course of the disease, the liquid and the pox dry up, and once they dry up, they then go away, but they do leave scars all over the body, so it can leave significant scarring. Infant fatality rate is around 80%. So there are two forms of smallpox. One is more serious than the other, uh, but nonetheless, both forms uh, pr produce a um, a, a severe illness. And uh, no one in society was spared from smallpox, really. For example, Ramses V, uh, an ancient Egyptian pharaoh, died from smallpox, as did Queen Mary II of England. Uh, there were many other royal figures as well who died from uh, smallpox. So, with regard to smallpox, it was well known that survivors of the disease were protected or immune from future smallpox infection. So the term immune comes from the Latin immunus, which means to be free or exempt from. And uh, this observation was made, you know, as early as 430 BC. And here on the right, we have an image of nurses caring for sick smallpox patients. 
So take home message here. Survivors were protected from smallpox. There were also other ways to protect against smallpox. And let's look at one of them. So centuries ago, there was this process called inoculation. And this was being practiced to help protect against smallpox. So the term inoculation comes from the Latin inoculare, which means to graft. And the process of inoculation with regard to smallpox goes something like this. You have a person infected with smallpox, and of course they develop this char characteristic rash all over their body. I mentioned that the pustules or pox contain initially some fluid. Now, if you get with a if you get a sharp needle or a lancet and you pierce some of the uh, the pustules and collect some of this fluid and intentionally inject it into the skin of someone who has never had smallpox, you can protect this person from developing uh, smallpox or a severe case of smallpox. So this is the process of inoculation. Grafting material, smallpox material from an infected person to someone who has never had the disease in the hopes of protecting them from the disease. And this process of inoculation was developed, as I said, centuries ago, and it's believed to have developed independently throughout the world. For example, it was practiced in China, Africa, and India centuries ago. In 1670, this process was introduced to Turkey, and in the 18th century, it was introduced to Europe via travelers from Istanbul in Turkey. But this process of inoculation is not perfect. First of all, it had a 2 to 3% fatality rate. But if we compare this to the fatality rate of smallpox, which had a 30% fatality rate, obviously the process of inoculation uh, has a low, lower fatality rate. Another complication was that you could transfer diseases from person to person through this process of inoculation. For example, bacterial diseases such as tuberculosis and syphilis could be transferred uh, via this inoculation process. But despite this, it offered some protection against this dreaded smallpox disease also known as speckled monster, and uh, it was popular in Europe and spread to the New World or to the Americas. So in 1757, now, in England, there were thousands of kids being inoculated against smallpox. And one of them was an eight-year-old boy who was inoculated. He later developed a mild case of smallpox, did not die, and he was later immune to this dreaded disease. And the name of this boy was Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner was a scientist and a physician. He had a strong interest in, in nature and science. Uh, he was also a member of the Royal Society for his work in biology and was invited by Captain James Cook on his second voyage to Australia, but Edward Jenner declined. So Edward Jenner, being a doctor, had heard these stories of milkmaids who were protected from, from smallpox after they had become unwell with a disease called cowpox. So let's look further at cowpox and exactly what it is. And, uh, you know, this prote the protection that these milkmaids were experiencing. So the smallpox virus belongs to a family of viruses called the Poxviridae family. And part of this Poxviridae family are other viruses. For example, there's a cowpox virus, there's monkeypox, and we had an outbreak of monkeypox in 2022. And um, yeah, so these viruses, although they affect, so these viruses can affect other animals. For example, cowpox can infect cattle and other mammals. Cowpox can also infect humans. But cowpox is a weaker virus, so to speak, when it comes to infections in humans. It has a much lower fatality rate, 1 to 3% fatality rate in humans compared to smallpox, which has a 30% fatality rate. And um, so what happens is infected cows, and here we have an image of a cow's udder, 
you know, the, the cow is infected with cowpox. Cowpox can be transmitted to humans and spread via contact. So once again, Jenna had heard stories of milkmaids who had contracted this cowpox virus who were later protected from smallpox. So they, they developed this disease that didn't that wasn't as bad as smallpox and had a lower fatality rate. So in 1796, Jenna vaccinated an eight-year-old boy, and his name was James Phipps, against smallpox. And the way he did it was different to the process of inoculation that we spoke about, and he did it something like this. So to begin with, obviously, there was a cow infected with cowpox, and the cowpox was transmitted to a milkmaid, and the name of the milkmaid was Sarah Nelms. And here we have a diagram of Sarah Nelms's hand. So what Jenna did, using a needle, he collected some of the material from this cowpox pustule from Sarah Nelms, and he injected it into James Phipps. James Phipps became slightly unwell. He developed some sore lymph nodes underneath his arm. He developed a fever. He was generally feeling unwell. But within a couple of weeks, less than a couple of weeks, he made a full recovery. Jenna then, from a person infected with smallpox, transferred some smallpox material now into James Phipps once again. But after he had been, um, after he had recovered from uh, the process of being inoculated with cowpox material, and James Phipps did not become unwell with smallpox and did not develop any smallpox. So it was deemed that this process of vaccination now had been complete. James Phipps had been protected against smallpox using a virus that is, in a sense, once again, weaker than smallpox, in the sense that in humans, it has a lower fatality, fatality rate and produces less severe symptoms than the disease you're trying to protect against, smallpox in this case. So Jenna was able to convince the world of this process of vaccination. And he, through his work, dedication and research on the topic, helped to develop vaccination into a science. It became popular and it actually replaced inoculation. So people began uh, being vaccinated against smallpox rather than inoculated. So this process of intentionally vaccinating people now with cowpox material as opposed to inoculating them with smallpox material. So Jenna, although this process of vaccination was accepted and he was protecting people against, you know, this, this horrific disease, smallpox, Jenna still had his critics. It was stated that he was playing God and that he shouldn't be injecting material from a cow into humans because that was considered ungodly. For example, there was some uh, artwork published in 1802, and the title is The Cowpock, All the Wonder Wonderful Effects of the New Inoculation. So here we see Jenna uh, vaccinating a patient here, and the options are, you know, either get smallpox or suffer the consequences of this process of va vaccination. It was, you know, some people believe that they would develop these cow-like uh, appendages from their body after being exposed to the cowpox virus uh, in, a, in an attempt to be vaccinated. So despite this, Jenna was able to convince the world and establish, establish vaccination as a science. Another person who was able to convince the world and who contributed to the field of vaccinology was Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was a, not a doctor but a chemist and he was a great communicator. He was able to convince members of the public uh, and lay people, as well as, sci as well as scientists, of his views, which were often supported by experimental evidence. So, do you remember Spallanzani and Schwann, who conducted experiments to disprove the theory of spontaneous generation? Well, Louis Pasteur was a great admirer of uh, Spallanzani and Schwann. For example, Pasteur, in a letter to Schwann in 1878, wrote, For 20 years now, I've been following some of the paths that you have opened. Uh, Pasteur also had uh, a painting of 
uh, Spallanzani hanging in his living room as well. So he was aware of 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 their work and admirer and an admirer of their work as well. So the world actually still needed some more convincing when it came to the theory of spontaneous generation, and it was Louis Pasteur who convinced the world. So Pasteur did an experiment, as I said, disproving spontaneous generation, and he dis and he disproved spontaneous generation forever. So Let's talk through Pasteur's experiment. It was similar to the previous experiments that we've discussed today, but it was a little bit different. But nonetheless, let's talk through it. So the first part of the experiment is the part that I've circled here. So Pasteur, he had a, an infusion containing some protein and some yeast, uh, and he boiled this infusion. And this infusion was in a swan neck flask. We can see the long uh, neck of this flask. A swan neck flask and this swan neck flask because it's so long and bent makes it difficult for uh, any matter in the air to reach this infusion which is inside here so the long flat the long neck makes it difficult for you know microbes and germs to reach to get all the way inside this uh, flask so nonetheless you have this infusion here and it was boiled to kill the microbes he let the flask sit and it cooled, and he waited and observed that no bacteria was present. So he bore this infusion, it was in the swan neck flask, the long neck prevented anything from entering, no germs entered, the broth did not spoil. Second part, he did the same thing. Boiled this infusion in a swan neck flask, but this time he broke the neck, now we have a short neck, meaning that germs can access the infusion, and the infusion went off. You know, microbes, bacteria, and, uh, and, and other microbes, they cause this broth to spoil. This infusion to spoil, rather. The third part uh, was, again, infusion in a swan neck flask. It was boiled, and Pasteur tilted the flask so that the infusion pour, um, found its way through the neck of the flask, and then he poured it he tilted it the other way and the, and the infusion went back in. But through this process of tilting and um, ha having the infusion, infusion access the neck of the flask, because bacteria could access the tip of the flask, um, he had now contaminated this infusion by tilting and, and, and letting some of the infusion travel through the neck. So through this, the infusion then spoiled. So all were exposed to air, for example, air could pass through. Uh, so this experiment disproved spontaneous generation for, forever. In fact, Pasteur gave a public lecture in 1864, and part of his lecture was, never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow of this simple experiment. Pasteur also worked with animals. So in one of his labs, he was... And this is this is how the legend goes. So legend has it that Pasteur was working with. Um, so there was a, there was an infection, bacterial infection called foul cholera, and it was a bacterial infection that caused that caused uh, uh, diarrhea in in chickens. And Pasteur was working on this bacteria in his lab. So once again, legend has it that um, he was working with this bacteria that causes cow, uh, foul cholera and he went on a vacation. And uh, supposedly he left this bacteria on the bench in his lab when he went on vacation. So upon his return, he continued the experiment and you know, continued where he left off. So he injected into some chickens the bacteria that he had left out. So the chickens became mildly unwell and completely recovered. They did not develop, you know, the foul cholera disease where chickens could die. So injected this old bacteria that was sitting on the bench and uh, mild disease. Chickens recovered. So what he then did, he instructed one of his assistants to uh, once again inject the chickens with the bacteria, but a fresh batch of bacteria, not an old one sitting on the bench, you know, because he observed an atypical response, you know, the, the chickens didn't become, you know, unwell as he had expected. 
So once he, after the assistant had injected the chickens with the fresh bacteria, he observed that the chickens showed no signs of illness. So what he proposed was that the process of the bacteria sitting out and being exposed to the air weakened the bacteria and made it a good way to develop a vaccine. So you can weaken what you inject into an organism uh, and this can contribute to the design of vaccines. It's the same kind of process that Jenna actually followed because Jenna utilized, as I said, a weaker bacteria, uh, sorry, a, a weaker virus, the cowpox virus, which was still, you know, uh, caused illness and made you unwell, uh, but he used something that was weaker than the disease that he was aiming to prevent. So here we have the same process. So Pasteur, equipped with this knowledge, focused his direction now on the rabies vaccine. Rabies is, again, the stuff of nightmares, like smallpox. Uh, it's caused by a virus, the rabies virus, and uh, the death rate is almost 100%. Once symptoms of rabies begin, uh, you're almost guaranteed to die. Uh, so it has a very high, almost 100% fatality rate. So this rabies virus is transmitted via uh, an uh, infected animal bite. So an animal infected with rabies, if it bites or scratches you, can transmit this virus. And in humans, rabies is most commonly spread through infected dog bites. So once a person is bitten, this rabies virus travels to the brain and travels to the muscles. It causes a host of symptoms, but some of them include hallucinations, aggressive behavior, becoming very agitated, confused, seizures, and eventually people die. So it's a horrible death and, uh, yeah, a, a, an insane virus, uh, literally the stuff of nightmares. So as I said, Pasteur directed his attention to rabies. So what he, ident what he and his team identified was that the rabies virus, you know, most commonly it was being transmitted from infected dog bites, but they identified that the rabies virus could be transferred from dog to rabbit. Okay, so equipped equipped with this knowledge that rab that uh, rabies could be that, that rabbits could um, be infected with rabies, um, he also discovered that the rabies virus could be obtained from the spinal fluid. So, if you want to try and make a vaccine against rabies, you have to be able to isolate the rabies virus, right? And it was determined that the rabies virus could be isolated from spinal fluid. So what he did, what he and his team did, they using rabbits that were infected with rabies, they isolated the spinal fluid from uh, the rabbits, and they exposed to air and dried this spinal fluid. Again, this process of exposing it to the air to weaken the virus in the hopes of developing a vaccine. Okay, because drying of the spinal fluid. So the spinal fluid contains the virus, and by drying the spinal fluid, you weaken the virus, and you can utilize this as part of the vaccine design. So there was a boy, nine-year-old boy, Joseph Meister, and in 1885, he was bitten by a rabid dog. And on the 6th of July, 1885, Pasteur and his team vaccinated this boy against rabies. So... Rabies, there's uh, a, a long period of time, uh, so a long incubation period between when a person gets bitten by a rabid animal and when they develop symptoms. So it could be a number of weeks or a number of months or a number of years before symptoms appear. And rabies is one of those, one of those diseases that you can prevent after you've been exposed to the virus. So a vaccine can help um, uh, prevent the disease. Uh, before symptoms appear. So this is the case with uh, Joseph Meister. So around 60 hours after he was bitten by a dog, he was vaccinated against rabies by Pasteur and his team. And the process went like this. He received a series of injections containing the spinal fluid that had been previously dried. So obtained, isolated from, obtained from uh, uh, rabbits and then dried. And he received a series of injection, injections. The first injection contained some spinal fluid that was uh, dried for a long time. 
Uh, the next injection he received contained some spinal fluid that was dried for a, a smaller amount of time and so forth until he finally received uh, spinal fluid containing the live rabies virus. So this was the design of the uh, rabies, rabies vaccine. So as I said before, Pasteur was a chemist, he wasn't a doctor, but he was, you know, uh, vaccinating this child against rabies, which was a fatal illness, and potentially he could have died from the vaccination itself. Uh, but lucky for Meister and also for Pasteur, this process of vaccination against rabies was a success. In fact, this method of using, you know, a series of injections uh, containing, you know, starting from... from uh, from weakened virus to uh, uh, the actual virus itself, uh, uh, this this kind of method was was used for more than 50 years before um, you know there were there were improvements to the design and um, and uh, progress was made to the to the rabies vaccine. So Pasteur was able to convince the world. He made major com contributions to microbiology and to immunology. And in 1887. There was a scientific institute founded in honor of Pasteur. So here we have an image of, of the uh, Pasteur Institute, which still stands today in France. And really, from this point on, vaccines further developed. Progresses in immunology, in microbiology, in medical science uh, resulted in uh, other vaccines being developed. For example, in 1918 to 1919, we had the Spanish flu. Uh, there were attempts to create a vaccine, but none was developed due to inconclusive results. In 1937, yellow fever vaccine. 1939, pertussis or whooping cough vaccine. 1945, we saw the first influenza vaccine. In 1955, the first vaccine against polio, developed by uh, Professor Salk. In 1960, uh, a different type of polio vaccine, the Sabin vaccine. In 1969, hepatitis B vaccine. In 1971, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, MMR vaccine. 1978, pneumococcal pneumonia vaccine. 1981, Haemophilus influenzae type B vaccine. So this is not every uh, this is not every vaccine developed in this period, but you know key vaccines that, that were developed. So back to the quotes in the beginning. In science, the credit goes to the man who convinces the world, not the man to whom the idea first occurs, because Jenner. Although he popularized, you know, the process of vaccination as a science and convinced the world, it was not Jenner who first came up with this idea. You know, there were stories of milkmaids, um, you know, recovering from cowpox. And in fact, others before Jenner were using cowpox to protect against smallpox. So Jenner did not come up with the idea. He did not discover this. The same is true for Pasteur. We know that Spallanzani and others conducted experiments disproving spontaneous generation. But it was up to Pasteur and his uh, devotion to the topic where he was able to convince the world of um, and, and disprove spontaneous generation and convince the world of, of other processes as well, uh, uh, important to immunology and microbiology. So we can see also that we all stand on the shoulders of giants and only by standing on the shoulders of giants are we able to see further. So a few closing remarks now. In 1980, the World Health Organization declared that smallpox had been eradicated forever. So smallpox is the first and only disease to be eradicated. First human disease to be eradicated. So here we have uh, a statue at the front of World Health Organization uh, headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. And we have a... Uh, a statue commemorating the 30th anniversary of uh, the eradication of smallpox. And here are some photographs uh, from that were published in 1904. So the first one, it shows a couple of brothers. Uh, the brother on the left was not vaccinated against smallpox. The brother on the right was. He developed a mild case of the infection. Same story here. A couple of sisters exposed to the virus at the same time. The sister above, of course, we can guess that she was vaccinated against smallpox and the photograph of the sister below, not vaccinated against smallpox. Here we have father and son. 
So the father in the family here, he was the only one in the family who chose not to be vaccinated against smallpox, whereas everyone else in the family was. And here we have the baby sitting safely next to the father. Remember, this was a vaccine with an infant fatality rate of around 80%. So there are plans to eradicate polio. Poliomyelitis is a viral infection, again, devastating virus. And there are plans to eradicate polio as the next infectious disease to affect humans uh, that can be eradicated. So um, th the future is bright, I hope, with regard to the eradication of polio and, of course, for other diseases as well. So some interesting facts just to close off once again. This process of pasteurization. Uh, so pasteurization is the process of heating wine, milk and fruit juice. And you heat it to a certain temperature for a certain period of time. And this process uh, reduces the, the number of bacteria. And uh, so the product lasts longer on the shelf and has a longer shelf life. And uh, the process doesn't impact the, the taste of the product. Um, so it, ma it maintains, uh, it, pr it preserves the nature of the product as well, making it safe for us to consume. So this process of pasteurization was named after Louis Pasteur who obtained a patent for, for this process for pasteurizing wine uh, in 1865. He offer, also offered a scientific explanation of how pasteurization worked. But Pasteur was not the first to pasteurize wine and not the first to pasteurize milk, for example. This was done by others um, before Pasteur had obtained the patent. But nonetheless, Pasteur was the one who you know, offered the scientific explanation for the process and pasteurization named in honor of Pasteur. So the next time you consume some pasteurized milk, just check out the label and think of Pasteur. Uh, second is the term vaca is Latin for cow. Um, so Edward Jenner, of course, who worked on the smallpox vaccine, had a friend and his friend was Dr. Richard Dunning. And Dr. Richard Dunning was a great admirer of Edward Jenner and his work. In fact, Ed, uh, Dr. Dunning named one of his sons after Jenner. He named his son Edward Jenner Dunning. And uh, Dr. Dunning came, Dr. Dunning rather, came up with the term vaccine and vaccination based from the Latin word vaca, meaning cow. Obviously, the association between cowpox and cow and Jenner's work. So that's where the term vaccination and vaccine comes from. And uh, do you remember we spoke about animalcules and uh, Van Leeuwenhoek and his animalcules? He was actually observing bacteria, uh, but there was a German scientist in 1828 and uh, he came up with the term bacteria, which comes from the Greek term little stick. And uh, he used some of uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's drawings of animalcules to come up with his hypo hypothesis of bacteria and uh, he named what he was observing to be bacteria. So the name bacteria was coined in 1828. So last but not least, the family barbecue scene. And I promised that I would relate it to the uh, history of vaccination. So the next time you have a family barbecue, for example, try and link what you've learnt, or majority of what you've learnt in today's lecture to this scene. For example, the way I see it is, you know, you've got a nice barbecue and we know that high temperatures kill microbes. So boiling things to high temperatures uh, was a key part of many of the experiments that disproved the theory of spontaneous generation, for example. Your pet dog, part of the rabies vaccine. We know that uh, rabies is most commonly transmitted in humans from infected dog bites and the dog represents uh, the, the legacy of Pasteur in developing the rabies vaccine. Because, you know, ra the rabies vaccine was transmitted from, from dogs to rabbits. And then he then used the spinal fluid from rabbits to develop the rabies vaccine. So uh, next time you think of your pet dog, your beloved dog that's, that's healthy and happy, um, uh, think of the rabies vaccine and Pasteur. The tree out in nature. Robert Hooke examined the bark of certain types of trees that produce cork. And he was able to determine that... Living, all the living things were made from cells. The meat that you're cooking at, at the barbecue, let's not forget Reddy and his experiments uh, disproving spontaneous generation. 
and the, and the idea that maggots can emerge from meat. If you're enjoying some wine or beef, for example, um, wine is pasteurized in honor of Louis Pasteur. Milk is also pasteurized, and this pasteurized milk is used to produce uh, ice cream and other dairy-based products. The sun, nice sunny day. Antoine van Leeuwenhoek, he discovered animalcules. He was really looking at uh, bacteria, and he used terms that describe, you know, the key classes of bacteria that we and we still use these terms today. Round, uh, rod-shaped, spiral, for example. Uh, he used a solar microscope, so he used the sun to produce a sharp, a better image of uh, the animalcules that he was looking at. And last but not least, happy, healthy family enjoying the moment and enjoying the barbecue together. Uh, vaccines keep us healthy and um, it's really about enjoying the moment with your family. So the next time you go to your doctor or pharmacist and you receive a vaccine, you're not simply receiving a vaccine, but you are standing on the shoulders of giants in a way and you're receiving uh, really the ideas of many that have come before us. So with that, I conclude with a brief history of vaccination and wish to thank you for watching and until next time. Thank you again. Bye-bye.